नमस्ते फ्रेंड्स हरिओम वेलकम टू द फोर्थ पार्ट ऑफ द सीरीज ऑन द डिस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ द टेम्पल ऑफ सेरापिस सो लास्ट टाइम वी लुक्ड एट द टू ब्रदर्स कॉन्स्टेंटियस द सेकेंड एंड कॉन्स्टांस हु काइंड ऑफ केप्ट द बॉल रोलिंग फॉर द क्रिश्चनाइजेशन ऑफ द रोमन एम्पायर बट वी हैव टू रिमेंबर दैट इम्पोजिशन ऑफ क्रिश्चियनिटी वॉज इंट अ फोर गॉन कंक्लूजन एट ऑल एंड वन मैन हॉल्टेड द प्रोसेस इन इट्स ट्रैक्स एंड ही स्टार्टेड द रिवर्सल Uh, and this great man was the emperor julian so christian theology or you know christian history also calls him julian the apostate uh, because he was brought up as a christian but he uh, had a ghar wapsi and went back uh, to you know the original roman dharma now his reign was barely for 2 years from around uh, 361 to 363 but he struck the fear of the devatas among the hierarchy of the early christian church and just as chhatrapati shivaji maharaj hari har rai bukkar rai uh, rana hamir dev chauhan and countless other uh, are ideals for us dharmics we need to em- add emperor julian to the defenders of sanatan dharma worldwide now let's understand the background and achievements of this man who flashed like a shooting star for a very brief moment across the the carpet of time so let's have a look and let me transition the slide there we go so who was julian <clears throat> now this statue uh, is supposed to be of julian but again experts are not sure uh, so we'll take it as julian so julian was a nephew of constantius 2 so remember the two brothers constantius the second and constans now constantius 2 was typically very insecure as most tyrants are and he massacred all of julian's relatives including his father and older brother so there were only two survivors one was julian and his elder brother gallus now both were raised pretty much under house arrest on a rural estate and they were tutored by fanatic christian bishops now which is why julian is referred to as julian the apostate by the christians because he was brought up as a christian but he went back to the religion of his forefathers or he went religion is not the right word he went back to dharma so how threatening julian was to the church and christianity's existence can be understood by a statement from a 4th century christian bishop uh, quite a well known person in christian theology his name is gregory of nazianzus and he was a very powerful person so he made one statement that constantius made only one mistake in his life and that was to let julian live and his statement was he that is constantius the second committed one mistake unworthy of his ancestral piety he did not realize that he was training up for christians an enemy of christ in this one thing he did not do well in showing kindness saving the life and giving rule to him who was saved and crowned for evil so by evil he means anybody who goes against the christian church or the christian dogma is evil pretty much so all of us you know dharmics are you know evil or heathens or pagans or whatever they call us so julian experienced conversion to reconversion to dharma while on his journey from nicomedia to milan and uh, as per julian uh, and his writings it happened at a place called new ilium uh, it's a roman greek city somewhere in greece now he also had a great sense of humor and was a superb administrator so somewhere between 360 and 363 of the common era he wrote a text in which he describes the attitudes of roman society towards him and his personality so quote and quote he says i have angered all of you the senate the middle classes and the people it is perhaps the people who hate me universally because they see me cling to the sacred rights of our fathers the powerful hate me because they cannot now make a lot of money with inflated prices so he was a superb administrator and he brought prices under control he brought inflation under control as though the length of my beard were not enough my head is unkempt also i am rarely barbered or manicured and my fingers are usually black from the pen and he and here is the funny part and if you would like to hear a secret my chest is hairy so he had a great sense of humor so you can kind of start building um, you know a rough picture of what kind of personality he was so let's have a look at uh, the extent of his empire now what happened by the mid 350s was you know constantius had eliminated all of 
competition and relations and the only person who could be nominated as his as the yuvaraja or the successor in line uh, or the kaiser was julian so he was the only survivor uh, gallus was assassinated by constantius as well so julian was given the command of gaul so let me get the laser pointer on so this is gaul which is uh, largely today's france on the 6th of november 355 uh, and he was married to constantius the second sister uh, a woman called helena so between 356 and 359 julian earned a very formidable reputation as a military commander so he defeated any tribe which came uh, which threatened the roman empire and to quote john holland smith he julian secured the rhine frontier so the rhine frontier is this one uh, it's the river rhine so pretty much the german frontier and rebuilt the ravaged cities of the north resumed grain supply from southern britain by building fleet of armed merchantmen to foil the pirates he curtailed corruption in the civil service reduced expenses and by this managed to cut taxes from 25 to 7 solidi so solidi was the currency of the empire and he won total allegiance of his soldiers now what constantius tried to do is obviously he became insecure so he tried to weaken julian's military base by demanding reinforcements which were pretty much julian's most powerful legions or most powerful units so this was in 360 and there was a stalemate uh, because julian refused to send the reinforcement he kind of kept making excuses and constantius then used the same strategy he had used against magnentius uh, he invited the barbarian tribes uh, from typically the uh, i think particularly it was the alamanni uh, to attack gaul from across the rhine frontier and julian made the attack he smashed the attacking army completely and he captured the leader who under obviously torture uh, told him of constantius plot to overthrow him but julian still did not want to fight constantius so he wanted to avoid civil war as long as possible and constantius was preparing to march against julian uh, from uh, from this part which is present day turkey Okay, so he was prepared to march against Julian, but um, the civil war did not materialize because Constantius died on 3rd November 360 of the Common Era, and he had already named Julian as his heir. So Julian uh, became the emperor. Now the first thing Julian did was to reign in the fat cats, and by fat cats I mean the hierarchy of the Christian Church. So all the top bishops right down to the lowest priest, everybody had become corrupt. Uh, because as we had seen they had got magisterial powers and they were making false wills they were coercing people into giving their property to the church so the church had become an incredibly rich institution so this uh, manuscript shows julian arresting a bishop and restarting sacrifices to the roman devotas and this is from a 9th century uh, parisian manuscript so what the christians expected was he would launch into a mass slaughter and they could then use this uh, bout of killing to proclaim you know that we are martyrs to christ and then we they would launch a crusade but he did not do anything of that sort and they were very disappointed again gregory of nazianzus uh, says quote and quote he begrudged to our soldiers the honor of martyrdom and so contrived to use compulsion without appearing to do so so he was defeating the christians by logic and by administrative steps in order that we might suffer and yet not win honor as we should suffering for christ sake he attacked our religion in a very villainous and ungenerous way introdu- introducing into his persecution the traps and snares of argument so he used logic and he typically used you know the um, christian theology against the christians and he left most christian officers in the administrative services as they were except those who had committed major crimes and were blatantly corrupt So some examples were uh, so Ursulus was a key official who had cursed the gods when Julian had restored you know the worship of the devatas so he was executed then there was another a very notorious one uh, the governor of Egypt a chap called Artemius so what Artemius had done was he had facilitated the 
a looting of the temple of Serapis by Christian fanatics. And he was executed, recorded and executed straight away. So Julian was disgusted by corruption and waste. And typically, you know, if you see any um, royal establishment or not even royal establishment in present day, if you, uh, even in democracies, if there's a dynasty, like in India, there was, there was the Gandhi dynasty, which was ruling India pretty much for most, uh, almost 60, 70 years. Uh, they typically have a large coterie of hangers-on who kind of leech off the family and leech off the state as well. And in the Roman Empire, this was true as well. So there were barbers, cooks, beauticians, and all hangers-on who simply leached off the state. And there was another uh, aspect, which was the secret service, uh, which was started by Constantius, was running a blackmail racket. Uh, they were blackmailing Christian bishops. So what was going on was they were getting prostitutes to visit the Christian clergy, the bishops, on the pretext of seeking advice. And eventually, when they were in a compromising position, an agent of the secret service would break in and threaten to expose. So almost like, you know, modern day, uh, you know, honey traps. And Julian put a stop to this. He disbanded the secret service completely. So that was gone. And it was interesting that the bishops who were promoting, uh, you know, celibacy, and all this kind of stuff, uh, you know, they themselves were uh, morally corrupt. So he decided to promote only Dharmics or pagans in his army because he told the Christians, look, you know, your Bible and your texts say that you are for forbidden to take the sword, so you shouldn't fight. And when the Christians started protesting uh, about all of this, he told them that their text advised them to suffer injustice in patience because they would be reward, rewarded in the uh, you know afterlife or whatever and he was actually helping them by doing injustice to the to save their souls and he forbade legacies to the church so nobody could write a will and simply give away all their property to the church and he deprived the bishops of the tax concessions which are granted to them because he told them look your gospels say you know you should be poor uh, so they preach poverty so why do you want so much money and property and he restored all property which had been stolen from the temples. And he also allowed the, the Christian bishops which, who had been exiled to return. So remember, you know, even by this point, there were sects in Christianity, there was infighting going on. So if one faction gained power or gained the year of the emperor, they would kick out all, everybody else, uh, you know, exile them to remote places of the empire. And during Constantius the second time, now remember I told you Artemius was the governor of Egypt who was executed by Julian. So there was a Christian fanatic bishop called George of Cappadocia. So different from George Gregory of Nazianzus. And this George was a former tutor to Emperor Julian. And he was known as the Pope Butcher because before you know entering the Christian church, he was a meat supplier to the Roman army. So he with the help of Artemius, looted or sacked the temple of Serapis somewhere around 360-361 CE. Now, as soon as Julian came to power, the Dharmics in Alexandria, they got together, attacked George, and they literally tore him to pieces uh, for, you know, desecrating the temple. Another important step Julian did was to restore education. Now, what had happened was with education, as happened in India during the British rule, uh, was the indigenous education was closed down or destroyed and you had this limited educational funnel of Christian missionary schools and colleges where essentially people were indoctrinated. This process is going on today as well and especially after the RTE Act or the Right to Education Act, uh, a lot of Hindu schools have closed down. So we are again back to that small funnel of Christian missionary schools and they are privileged even in India today because uh, they have various tax concessions because they are a minority. They can take government grant, but they can make their own rules. Whereas Hindu schools can't do all of that. So Julian forbade Christians to use classical texts in teaching. Now remember, Christians had no uh, educational materials at this point. They were using all the Greek and Roman literature. Uh, so what this meant was that Christian teachers could not teach in schools anymore because there was, they had nothing to teach. And his argument was that if the reading of your scriptures is sufficient for you, why do, why do you make such a fuss about the learning of the Hellenes? Hellenes are the Greeks. From studying your writings on man, sorry, from studying your writings, no man could achieve excellence or even ordinary greatness. 
whereas from studying hours every man can become better than before so this is very prescient and very accurate and he continues further on education so his view on education quote unquote i hold that a proper education results not in a laboriously acquired balance of phrases and language but in a healthy state of mind and those who profess to teach anything whatsoever ought to be people of upright character and ought not to harbor in their minds opinions irreconcilable with what they publicly proclaim so people who teach so teachers lecturers tutors should be of a very high moral standard and they should not be hypocrites and learning education is not about gathering certificates or going through the motions and doing 12 years of school 4 years or 3 years of college and so on it's about becoming a better contributor a better member of society so again very far sighted person and julian was particularly disturbed by one thing which was the degradation of roman dharma over the years and there is an example of when he goes to a place called antioch uh, which i think is in syria present day syria and he saw that people had lost the spirit of religion and they were going through the rituals just doing the motions without understanding what it was without appreciating and they had stripped down a lot of the rituals what is happening in among hindus in india today as well and people would not support the temples but they enjoyed the dances which formed the part of the ritual so think about garba so i'll just leave you with the thought of garba where where garba was even till 1980s and what it has become today and you will realize what i'm saying they still celebrated their own birthdays uh, they had the feasts and the pujas which were part of the religious ceremonies for the devatas but they would not do anything for the devatas on their anniversary so whatever say tuesday wednesday whatever day or one day in the year and he went to a, a temple in Ant, uh, antioch uh, which was a key temple and i don't remember what devata it was but here was his comment i pictured the procession for the gods to myself sacrificial animals libations dancers for the god in their stations and the young people of the place pressing around the shrine their souls adorned in holiness and their bodies dressed in white and splendid clothing so this was the picture in his mind big procession you know like a rath yatra what uh, what we have today but when i went to the sec- sacred enclosure i found there not a single grain of incense not a single beast when i inquired what the city uh, planned as an offering to celebrate the annual festival of the god a priest told me i have brought a goose from home as the god's offering the city has made no preparations so this was you know dharma in a very deep decline because society by that point um, had been deracinated and secularized you know this is what has happened in india as well so it's almost like a parallel which is going on and this process continues in india because while people have become more religious in a sense especially in northern western india of going more to temples their understanding has become very shallow and it's more um, what do you say so the religious rituals have become more superficial shortcuts and so on okay and this great man um, he died in march 363 so he started the persian campaign um, on 5th march 300, 363 of the common era so persia or old iran and rome the roman empire were mortal enemies always fighting always fighting and he kind of defeated the persians and he had kind of penetrated very deep into persia on 21st june uh, the persians attacked his camp but he was a, you know he was a very hands on emperor so he joined his troops in fighting and he didn't have time to put on his armor so what happened was a christian assassin so a christian soldier in his army he hit him in the on the side of the stomach i think with a javelin with a spear and this smashed through his liver and spleen uh, julian was aware pretty much straight away that he wouldn't survive so libanius the philosopher had described uh, the last scene when you know the surgeon says there is no hope and all his army units they are all you know very sad uh, several people are crying so libanius had described him like this this destiny was a gift to him from the gods whose temples he rebuilt whose honors he restored with their sacred enclosures their their altars their blood having learned from them that once he had humbled the pride of the persians he would soon die he brought glory at the price of his life 
taking many towns, reducing large areas of the country, so defeating the Persians, taking the fight to those who had been hunting him and finally dying. As everyone knows, on the eve of receiving a deputation, bringing him the submission of force, now King Shapur of Persia had prepared an embassy saying we are we surrender and uh, he was preparing to send them, you know, with uh, it was an unconditional surrender pretty much. He delighted therefore in his wound, gazing joyfully upon it, asking those who were weeping if his lot was not preferable to going growing old. So you can see this is almost this is identical to you know our Sanatan Dharma or Hindu Dharma. This is how all our great kings and emperors you know uh, met Virgati on the battlefield. So this is the spirit. You know that's fine. I'll come back. Uh, this is just one life out of many. So what is the big deal? Uh, you know I would rather die in battle and remember for my deeds rather than die of old age. So this was the end of a great emperor. And see his reign was just for two years, but he came very close. To eradicating Christianity from the Roman Empire and you know the world would have been saved not just Christianity but Islam as well uh, but you know history is not about why this is just what happened but we do need to remember uh, Emperor Julian so that's all for this time and uh, thank you for watching so next uh, time we'll continue further because we are now getting closer to the destruction of the Serapium and if you like this video Please remember to share, subscribe and like. I will see you next time. Thank you.